an open source. So WSO2 is a pretty good fit for that. Really, there's nothing else that kind of fits, those, fits, fits that criteria. So that's what we did. And like at any company uh, that takes on a big piece of software like WSO2, there's a lot of integration work to do. You've got to you know, adapt it to your own infrastructure, your own s systems, your own security, all that kind of stuff. And also, we're a bank, a big bank. We have like over 13,000 developers and lots and lots of historical technologies. And also, because we're a bank, we're under extra regulations. So we have extra work to do to make sure everything is, is extremely secure. So those were kind of the challenges that we started with. And so we wrote two main tools that I'm going to show you. Uh, first, I'm going to show you the API store, which is what you see on the screen right now. And then I'm going to show you our API designer and publishing tool. Uh, just so you know, we, the components we use of WSO2 are, the, of course, the API manager and all its subcomponents. And we use the governance registry, and we use the ESB, and we use BAM. And I'm going to show you how we've integrated them and how we use them. So this is our API store in production. It's probably hard to see, but this little number here says there's 130 APIs in production. These APIs we use actually internally, and also our external customers call them directly. We also have lots of other environments, just like any company might, for staging different things like development and testing and QA. But this is, this is actually production. And you might wonder, why did we write our own UI when there's already a perfectly good one that comes out of the box with the API manager. That's true, there is, but we had a lot of special needs and a lot of customization we wanted to do. So we felt this was the best route to just write something from scratch. This is a single page Angular JS app. Um, and it, luckily, the WC2 has, API manager has APIs for the store and for publisher. So you can, pretty easy to write this application that we were able to do and totally in terms of those APIs. So uh, the first thing you can see is this, We've got these 130 APIs here, and this is the catalog page that you start on by default. And you can pick a category. These are business segments that are very specific to the bank. And this is a very small example of something we added. It's very, very small, but the data element that's behind this is actually a piece of data that we did by extending the basic default schema so that we could implement this requirement we had. You can also just do freeform search and find things this way. And when you find something you want, you get this standard representation of any API. And it's basically two main parts. There's this upper section here, which is just the informational section. And then this colorful section below is the, the description of the API. So it's the Swagger UI control, 2.0 control, that we've curated and customized a bit for our own needs and tightened up the security a little bit. It, you probably all know what Swagger is, since that's what the API manager uses as well. But in, just as a quick summary, in case you don't know, it's it's really just a JSON file that describes a RESTful API, everything you would ever need to know about it, input and output, and also, in some cases, can allow for interactive testing. And so that's what we standardized on. And we actually added this ourselves. Um, and so we do it as a, we actually store this as an as a associated document. And luckily, also, the, um, the API has a, a way to create documents. The WSO2 API Manager Store API has a way to create documents and manage documents. So this is just a related document that lives for the life of the API. And we also had one other section we've added, which is this documentation, which is meant to be take off, uh, pick up where the Swagger documentation stops. So this is really more for diagrams or sample requests, sample responses. And we represent this as Markdown, again, just stored in a related document. And so that, worked, that was a pretty easy thing to add. A lot of the data on this page actually are just extra data elements that we added that, that suited our needs. So once you find something you like, you can go ahead and subscribe. And the, the, you probably already know most of this, so I'll go a little faster. But this page here, after you've subscribed, it's really, well, this is the intermediate page. And this is where you decide how you'd like to group your subscription. You can group it with an existing subscription or put it in its own application container. And then you can also select what throttling you want. And the throttling tiers are really preset by the publisher, and then you get to choose among those. But I'll just take the defaults and actually subscribe to this. And when you subscribe, this, this page that you're taken to now, the subscription detail page, it's really very similar to the catalog detail page we were looking at a second ago. It just, got, it just has two extra things. It's got this little application section here, which is these are your actual you know, OAuth v2 keys that give you access to the API. And then this little usage section here that shows you how to use those keys and how to eventually call the API. The one thing I just really wanted to show you here and highlight is the grant types. So we support different grant types depending on what environment you're in. 
And this first grant type here, client certificate, is actually a custom grant type we added. And OAuth 2, as you, as you probably know, is designed to be extended. And it's pretty easy to do this in WSO2 API Manager, especially in the latest version. It's pretty easy to add a new custom grant type. So this, this custom grant type client certificate represents an X509 certificate. We've got um, customers and partners that are very comfortable with mutual SSL. So we wanted to offer that, but we wanted to do it in a kind of an OAuth way so that the basic idea, the basic flow of generating a token and using a token to make the calls would still happen. So that's what, that's what that is, and we've been pretty successful with that. These other two grant types, they're pretty close to out of the box. We did a little bit of curating, but one nice thing about API Manager is you get a built-in authorization server that implements OpenID Connect. So you already have a, a UI out of the box that we, we did change a little bit, but that, that UI will authenticate the user and also let the user uh, consent to the application to be able to access their resources. So this, these three grant types really cover a lot of ground. Client server covers most B2B scenarios. Implicit's really good for writing you know, UIs, like this one, like single page apps. And authorization code is sort of somewhere in the middle for letting, literally allowing for offline access. So quite a few use cases covered by just this alone. So that's the basic store as far as getting started, finding the, um, finding the, uh, applica the APIs you're interested in, subscribing. And then eventually, once you've built an application, and the application, of course, is built of these, these APIs as building blocks, then you can monitor and, and go ahead and see how, the, how it's doing operationally. So this is our analytics for doing that. We're a, a company that strongly believes in evidence-based management, so we try to propagate that principle throughout everything we do for ourselves and our customers. So what's underneath this? right here is BAM. I, I, you might wonder, why are you still using BAM? Why are you using something newer but or different? We, we actually like BAM quite a bit because it's, it's really pretty basic. It's mostly just open source software. It's just Cassandra and Hive and uh, an RDBMS for the, the final aggregated results. And when you're doing this kind of uh, analytics, the, the API analytics are very predictable and repeatable. So pre-aggregation is a pretty good way to go for this story. So that, we chose that. Um, and one thing that was missing in BAM was a generic way of querying analytics. You could store a prepared SQL statement and run that, but we needed it to be parameterized by things like these time interval units, if you're doing a time series like you're seeing right here, being able to, of course, and be able to parameterize the date range, what dimensions you want for grouping by, and metrics and so forth. So we wrote an API, and one nice thing about BAM and really all carbon products is you, you kind of get a... API framework out of the box. So we, were, we didn't have to stand up anything new to do that. We were able to write this API inside of BAM and it's hosted for us for free and it has access to data sources like the ones it's getting to right now. Um, so we made that little modification so that we could do this. We have two main kinds of queries. The kind you're looking at right now, which is meant is a time series that ag is aggregating by whatever time unit you pick over here. And then we have one that summarizes just over your first main dimension, in this case, this group by is uh, grouping by API. And you might wonder why I have so much data here. This seems like a lot of data. So normally, when someone logs into this, this is really a developer portal. So when you log in here, you would normally only see analytics attributed to traffic related to your subscriptions. But we have other roles we've defined, and one of those is like a super publisher role, and I happen to have that role. So I'm able to see things that other people wouldn't necessarily see. We've got other slices too by organizations, and there's, so there's, there's several roles. And what's neat about the roles, by the way, is also we just use the built-in roles that existed already in the basic WC2 product. So you can add new roles, new permissions, and all that. And so this role that lets me see all these publisher analytics uh, instead of just only consumer analytics is enforced strictly by the underlying system. And then the UI also queries for that role and changes things around a little bit and presents me other options. Uh, if I have that role. You can also go a lot further than this. You, can, you might want to know not just which APIs are performing the best and what are their basic metrics like their error rates and response time, but you might also want to look at well, who are my users using this or what resource paths, I'll, I'll do that one, what resources are people using the most and how are those individual resources being used? And that would help you know what is important to focus your attention on next. You might find there's a whole bunch of resources that aren't used at all. Let me whittle this down a little bit and just pick uh, the top six or so so it's easier to see. Okay, so here's six APIs that are, have an awful lot of traffic. Well, now that I've set up this secondary group by, it serves as a drill down now, so I can now drill down into any one of these 
And I can now see the breakdown in this case by resource path. And it, it's pretty interesting. You can see, I don't know how easy it is to read, but you can see the, um, is it hard to see this, by the way? Uh, if no one says no, I'll assume you can, you can see, hard to see? Let me see if I can make it a, a little bigger than this. I can at least do that. I can also, let me go up a little, a little bit more here. So if you, you know, if I hover, it'll show me the response, except it won't now. Yes, it does. Show me the response time and error rates and things like that. And I can see that this resource is performing pretty well. Uh, this one is, it doesn't seem to like to work in this mode exactly. Go back here for a second. Hmm. I'm not sure what I've done. I've upset it. But that's the basic idea of this. And then at this point, now these are, like I said, these are two queries that one, one for time series and one for just summarization over the first dimension. And by default, we pick some visualizations that make sense for those, the line graph for the time series, the bar chart in this case. I can also, I, but I don't have to visualize it as a graph. If I rather just see the raw data, I can go to this table and just get to the raw data this way. And I can go ahead and if I, I could sort by traffic errors to see who's got the most errors, or I could see which API is performing the slowest or the fastest, that kind of thing. And then I can also take this data and just export it this way by choosing this, and this will generate a CSV file that you can then bring into Excel or some other process. So that's kind of the sum of what we've, we've done. You can see how we used the API manager pretty extensively and customized it, and how we used, took BAM and modified it to suit our needs. Now I'd like to show, so this is our, that's the store tool. I'd like to show you the other tool where we put quite a bit of energy into, and that's our designer and, um, I'm gonna log out and log back in, and uh, publishing tool. So this tool is meant for just our own uh, service groups to come along and publish their APIs. And it's, it's meant to be a self-serve tool. It could also be used, although it isn't yet, for third parties to do the exact same thing. So it's completely self-serve. We've got these five environments, five main, five main environments that we use. We've got a lab environment, which is the lowest level environment, and that's the one that's completely self-serve. And then we've also got um, the usual other environments, a development environment, a test environment, a QA environment, production. So if I actually go to uh, the first environment, lab, um, so you'll see that we've got quite a few APIs here, over 700 APIs, that's, that's a lot. Let me show the, and if someone wants to publish an API, so you can see if they happen to, these little dots kind of just show you which environments an API is in at this point. If I want to publish an API, if I already have a RESTful API ready to publish, I can just go ahead and publish it this way myself. And you really just fill out everything that's on this screen. It's mostly just the name and there, a lot of the endpoints. Some things are optional, like the icon and the swagger and documentation you can add to that later. Um, this tool, though, also is used for managing an API across environments. So this other listing I'm showing you here that's about to come up, this, this listing is really more centric around environments and everything in this list is sorted by the greatest number of environments that an API is in. So if, if I scroll down, for example, you'll see that the APIs are eventually in less and less environments and finally only in the lab because they haven't been promoted. So we have different governance that occurs at different levels as we move through the environments. Um, so you can see at the lab level, there's quite a few and by the time you get down to production, uh, only a, under, a, under 200. So another thing that's built into this tool is the ability to evaluate the, how RESTful your API is and how much it's adhering to our, our guidelines that we put in place. So if I found so every single API in here has a rating and it's, it's just more of the self-serve. So this one has a, so it's kind of like a lint tool. This one has 80% rating, which isn't really good enough to be promoted, probably. Um, and if you look at the, what it's mentioning, it's mentioning things like uh, it's, it's detected what it thinks is a date, but it's, there's no format date or date time. Or it's looking at this post and it notices that you have both a, a 200 and a 201, and it should really just be a 201 in this case. And the schema is associated with the wrong response code, little things like that. If you look down here, that might be hard to read. Let me go up here. Yeah, a little easier to read up here. It's complaining about this right here, this first post, and it's because it doesn't follow our, our RESTful pattern. Of, and our RESTful pattern is collection and then some ID within that collection, then an optional sub-collection and another optional 
ID within that collection and so on. And here you can see there's three IDs in a row. So something is wrong with this API. It shouldn't, shouldn't look like this, at least according to the standards we're enforcing. Um, if you are a promoter, that's another role, and there's a designated set of people in a group that can do promotions, and they're intentionally, they don't need to be, but they're intentionally separate of the people that are actually providing the service because there needs to be separation of roles. It's one of those regulation things. But if you have the role, you can promote this, and you can decide how much of it do you want to promote, just the swagger only if that got updated or the documentation, or you could promote the entire thing. And I, I'm not going to actually promote this, but if I click this button here, it would get promoted. And so there's structure around across the environments where things get promoted. It has to follow the actual natural order. Let me go back to one other thing here, back to the API listing. So you can see this is a huge number of APIs, and I, I might not want to see every API. Sometimes I do because I want to see, I'm curious what other people have done. Maybe I'm creating an API that already exists. I don't want to create the same thing. I can also just look at my own APIs. So this was another thing we added, and it, we built another API around this inside of the WC2 framework, and this is adding a layer of organizations. And I belong, in fact, to three organizations, and I'm looking at all the APIs right now in this organization. And so this is for uh, creating collaboration for editing these APIs and working on them, and it's also for looking at views of analytics later on, too. And so I can, if I wanted to, for example, add someone else to my organization, I can go to my organization here. I can go and say manage users. And then I could add a new user here. And I can choose what level of access do I want them to have. Do I want them to be an admin or just a user that's really more of a read-only mode? And then I can pick whoever I wish to add down here. So this was another thing that was fairly easy to add. We felt it was something we had to have uh, because we have lots of teams working on things. It's rarely rarely an individual working on things. So that's, that's the basic publishing capabilities we, we built, and you can see how we've extended it in a few ways. The other thing I want to show you is the design part. Um, and so we, we built some tools. So if you have a RESTful API and it's in perfectly good shape, you can just publish it and use the self-serve tools and you're, you're happy. But if you, you might have an API that needs a little bit of work. It might just need some, a few simple things like it's, it's perfectly RESTful, but maybe you want to do a little bit of uh, renaming of parameters in or out, or maybe you just need to pass a hidden query parameter or do something with cores headers or add a basic auth header or add some other header, that kind of stuff. So you can do this, and this, this will just generate a ESB Synapse configuration, and then you're just placed in the editor, and you can just go ahead and modify it all you like and deploy it and try it and all that. Or you could uh, try to make use of a SOAP server. So we put a lot of energy into this tool, and the reason we did is we noticed there was quite a bit of soap around our company, as there are in lots of companies, and this seemed like a really good uh, case to tackle. So we've got lots of customers using soap, and that's fine, and we don't want them to stop using soap. But then there are other sets of customers that would rather get to the same underlying data, the same underlying services, but they'd rather get it in REST, um, and because that's where their expertise is, or that's what the frameworks they use want to want to work with. So. The way this tool works, you start with the WSDL, and if you, if you know about SOAP, you know that WSDL is the, is the definition for the web service. So this, is, this describes the whole service. So you import a WSDL, and then what this tool does is it recursively starts with the WSDL and finds any nested WSDLs and finds any imported XSDs, and then it grabs them all and examines them all. And then it tries to, by, by pattern matching and by examining the input and the output, it, it tries to suggest a, a RESTful transformation. So, that's why we call this a designer, because you're actually, it's a RESTful facade that you're designing. From the user's point of view, this is the API. It doesn't make a difference that there happens to be soap in the back end. Um, so there's some red here, and this is telling me that I've got some duplicates for some reason, and let's take a look why. I could just push this button, and it'll just rename things, but something about its own logic tripped itself up, so let's see what happened. So there was a soap operation here, let me zoom in a little bit, called get advanced document. And when it was all done applying its rules, it said, okay, that should be the HTTP method get, and the resource should be called documents. That seems, that seems fine. But then, unfortunately, it did the same thing down here, get document. It also called that get documents. So I could just rename this, and that would be the end of that. But actually, I don't even want this, because it turns out this is a deprecated operation. And really, this new one up here that it was conflicting with is the newer one. So I'm, I'm happy with that. There's another thing you might see here, which is this little shield. And what that is, is it's telling us that it, it would, would have liked to have made this a get, but instead 
it's proposing a post because it thinks there might be sensitive data in here. And if we look in here at the parameters, in this case, the one it's identifying is account number. And it's worried that account number is not an opaque thing, but something that's actually important that you wouldn't want to be exposed to somewhere. And of course, we send everything at runtime over HTTPS, so you're probably wondering why would that really matter? Because a get message and a post message, they're, they're exactly the same by the time it's inside the, the HTTP message. But there are two places it can leak. If you're, at, if you're a developer and you're just experimenting with the API and you happen to use your browser and you happen to type in this API call, API call into your address bar, the browser could cache it. Or on the other far end of things, after it's gone through our whole network, our load balancer, and it finally reaches the web server that decrypts this message, it could wind up in a web log. So this is to trying to prevent that from happening because we're very, very mindful of, of security. So that's what this is a warning. But you could ignore it and just say, I, you're wrong. I, re I really want it to be a get or something else. In fact, everything on here, whether you include it or exclude it or how things are named, they're all just guesses. And they're usually pretty good guesses, but you don't have to keep the guesses. In this case, it turns out I actually don't want this one either because this is the other deprecated resource. It's actually been replaced by the advanced version of it, as it's called here. So I'm just going to use this one instead. One thing I should point out, you might notice that in this column here, sometimes you see these things that are like IDs. And so what it did here is it's proposing that document ID is best represented as a path parameter, not a query parameter for this get. And there's different rules of how it decides to do that. In this case, I think it was pretty simple. It just simply stripped off ID and compared it to the singular of the collection name, and they matched, and it ended up with ID, so it figured it's probably the ID for this collection. But you could change that to something else if it's wrong, or just turn it off completely and do the same thing for any other get. Um, so, but in, in this case, it actually guessed right. Another thing you can do that's in here is you can s set up some tags. These are just swagger tags that will wind up in the resulting swagger that this thing's going to generate in a second. I'll just make up a few real quick so you can see the effect of it. That's enough, and I'll, sh I'll show you what that does in a minute. And before I generate this, I'll just point out a couple of things. So there's some code generation rules that you can modify and change to, your, to however you want to. And some of that's just the pattern matching. Some of it is the formatting of, of things. And then in the code generation section, this is, this is the part I really wanted to show you. One, the security mediation, that's pretty important. If you have an existing SOAP service, somehow it has to authenticate the user. And this is a very different model because we're only authenticating once at token generation time. And then at future calls, you don't. You're just passing in the token. So how do we make that work? So we've got a few options. One of them is this LDAP. And that's just a, a, that's a custom mediator we wrote that knows how to determine the principle and look up into our corporate LDAP. And, pull out the necessary data to build a template to build a, ultimately build the SOAP security header. So that's a pretty good way of doing it um, because it's dynamic and it really respects whoever the caller is. Or you could say none, and if you had the ability to modify the SOAP server, you could just, and you know how to use the kind of security we're using, which is, by the way, just the out of the box WSO2 mechanism of passing in the principle in a JWT assertion header. If you can modify the SOAP server to take that, then you can just, you can just leave it here. Or if you just want to, interactively test with different sets of credentials. You could have the credentials go into query parameters, or you could do what I'm going to do and just take literal values if you're just testing so you don't have to spend time on that part while you're testing. One more thing I wanted to show you is this consumes here. So these are the MIME types that you're willing to accept for posts and puts. And the backend service doesn't know anything about this. This is completely done inside the ESP. So if the defaults are JSON and form URL encode it which I'll just, I'll just keep. And what it'll generate, you'll see in a second, is some code in the ESB that does content mediation and, and just deals with the, the two different MIME types appropriately in, in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this and uh, simultaneously generate it and simultaneously deploy it to the ESB. We can see what it does. So what it did was it generated a few helper sequences that it needs. It generated the swagger, and you can see those tags I created, documents and other here. I mean, normally you would have probably tagged everything. And it also generated, of course, the most important part. This is the mediation. This is the Synapse file that lives in the ESP. And I don't know how easy you can see this, but if you look at this top part, so this is a post against documents. So if you look at this top part, you can see there's a switch here on the HTTP header content type. And then if it's form URL encoded, it gets the data one way. If it's JSON, it gets it with JSON path, and it, otherwise it generates an unacceptable fault. But assuming you get through that, and then it just goes ahead and builds a SOAP message here. And you can see where it's just put in those literal credentials here for the SOAP security header. 
And when it's finished, well then it, after building the whole payload, then it goes ahead and makes the call here. And that's just uh, that endpoint it got out of the WSDL. And then when the response comes back, it converts it into JSON with this line. And then eventually what it does is it strips off the, the envelope and the operation wrapper so that it looks more like a, what you'd expect in a RESTful response. You don't expect to see hints of SOAP. Um, so we should actually be able to try this since I've just deployed it. So let me, let me try that now. So if I call something, if I go back to this and I look around at, didn't need to have this open. One second here. Oh, yeah, if I just pick something like, um, just trying to find, okay, so maybe this one, carriers is pretty innocent because it's only got, uh, it doesn't have any input, so it's very easy to test. So I can say, I, I'm gonna call the endpoint directly. Normally, you would publish this, which we can do, but when you're behind the firewall that I am, if you're a developer, you could go ahead and temporarily call the ESP endpoint directly so you can try things. Actually, let me um, make that a little bit more readable. So you can see what it returned. It returned this simple payload, no hints of soap in it. This was carriers. If I went and looked at that over here, you'll see it looks just like the other one. Just builds the soap payload, and you can see down here where it eventually pulls off the envelope and all that, and the, and the operation wrapper. I could also, I could try something a little bit more ambitious. Um, let's see, documents is, so this is this API, by the way, is for storing images in a secure way where they can't be tampered with once they've been scanned in and then you can annotate them and things like that. Um, so let's see, and this, this API also is in, actually in production, it was built from this tool, so we know it works. Okay, so I've just asked for a list of all documents for a given department, and again, you can see you just get this nice little payload that comes back. And one thing that's also nice, at least it follows the pattern we, we uh, encourage, is the fact that it, we did build it with the whole collection slash ID pattern. I can just take any document ID, like let's say just one I happen to see here somewhere. Oh, there's one. I can take that, and then if I just, take this exact same call, but instead of querying for documents, I'm gonna ask for one specific document, that one, and I should get it back. And what you're seeing here, besides this metadata and the, and the date and stuff like that, this is actually um, just a base 64 encoded representation of the image that was scanned in, so it's not, not super curl friendly, but, but that's what it is. So that's our tool for, and we actually have maybe, I'm not sure exactly, probably about 10 or more APIs in production that took advantage of this tool. And so we keep refining it because there's so much soap at our company. I was gonna publish it, but there's only about a minute and a half left. I could try real quick. So if you wanted to publish something, you saw earlier when you publish, this is just a starting point and where you type everything in from scratch. Or you can start from the ESB's point of view. So I could pick that thing we just generated here. Probably won't have time to do this, but. I'll try anyway. And you can, there's some metadata you need to fill out that we require, it's also part of our regulations. We have to know who's doing what and what businesses and stuff like that. Most of what's in here though is optional. So I could pick this name and I'll call that the short name. Uh, do the same thing here, but I'll call this one the long one. You see where these things really go. And I could do, um, if I wanted to, I could do some markdown over here. So that's what we use. You can also do HTML, but we mostly encourage markdown more stuff. I could upload, uh, it's already got my swagger. It, it pulled it in from when it generated it the first time, so I don't have to do that. I could also, if I wanted to, I'll just do one more thing, upload an image for this. Does it go in some magical window somewhere? Oh, there it is. Um, I'll just pick doesn't really matter, any image at all. Oh, I got it twice now. Okay, I'm not sure I got one at all in the end. No, I didn't. I don't know if that's everything, but let's find out. Looks like it, looks like it was. So now this has been published to the API store in the lab environment. So at this moment, I could go into the lab environment, which is here, sign in, 
and I should be able to find it. And the main point, though, is not only can I find it, I can subscribe to it, and I can start testing out the lab's API gateway. So that's, that's all part of the, the self-serve experience. Let's see if we can find it. So that was image 46. Hmm. Where is it? One, I forgot what I called it. It was, oh, image service 46, I see. Okay, so yeah, here it is. You can see that short description was on the tile. It went kind of fast there, and here's the long description would appear here. And if I went and looked at the, and you could, once again, you can see those same tags we created earlier. If I went and, and all, of course, everything else is in here too, the, the complete response schemas and all that kind of stuff that matched the payloads exactly because it, it generated the mediation. You could look at the documentation, not very interesting documentation, but, um, but you get the idea. So that's the, I think I have, ooh, I'm negative time, so maybe I'll stop. So that's, the, that's our publishing tool and that's what we've done so far. Um, and we're, we're continuing to work with WSO2. We're in the process of upgrading to all the latest versions of everything. Um, we're still on, we're about to, we're just now uh, upgrading to the 2.0 level of stuff. Since we started quite a while ago, um, we're, we're still on an older version. So that's, that's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to show you.